for the our March uh, presentation in um, our webinar series, uh, Master Naturalist Mondays. I am so grateful. Um, we have 66 people on right now. That's 67. That's 68. <laughs> this is, I, uh, I'm really excited. Um, so if you're new to the webinar series, I have uh, kind of ed worked into the flow of this hour, um, a reflective prompt. And that's just kind of a way for um, the Nebraska Master Naturalist community and then our guests that are here with us today um, to um, connect a little bit, just a little bit of connection. So we'll have a reflective prompt, um, a reflective prompt can be anything from uh, a f an image, a, f uh, a meme, a quote, and um, just we'll uh, pop your reflections into the chat or um, unmute yourself and, and, um, and, and let us know your reflections. And then we'll have the 30, 35 minutes for our pre with our present presenter. And then at the end, um, I'll have some, uh, some updates as well as a call to action. So I'm just gonna go ahead and start uh, with our reflective prompt. Let me share my screen. Okay, so, um, let's see, what is this all y'all? Let's put this in presenter mode so it looks all pretty. Okay, we are ready to go with our, let me admit some more people. Okay, here we go. So, we can take a moment to uh, reflect on this image and uh, what words, phrases, or feelings does this image elicit? And again, pop these into the chat. Okay, I'm gonna read some of them. Uh, Hi, everybody. I'm glad you told me where you were hailing from. That's great. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, <laughs> cookie cutter. Sterile. Um, and there is no right or wrong answer, okay? Just, I want to want that to be very clear because uh, we have spring and happy, right? Um, sterile, order, control, monoculture, desert, uh, boring. Um, sad, Edward Scissorhands, that's <laughs> uh, too green. Lots of sterile, lots of boring, um, poison, monochromatic suburbia, shiny, new, and sterile. Um, I do want to say for anybody that is feeling good things about this, I have a little weird thing because we're all products of our environment, right? And uh, uh, because we kind of all grew up with that that lawn, right? And those smells and those memories of the of that can elicit some happy memories. So that is, those, those emotions are not wrong either. I just want I want to tell you, uh, no thinking, not life sharing. Where's the snow? <laughs> um, <clears throat> Homeowners Association. Very good. The smell. <laughs> Our presenter. This is lovely. I love this. The smell of freshly cut lawn is the lawn screaming it's under attack releasing VOCs to warn other plants. So <laughs> that's lovely. Cookie cutter. Okay, so let's move on to the next image. 
what words, phrases, or feelings does this image elicit? And feel free to unmute yourself as well. Natural, somebody says too wild for me. Life. <laughs> ben, you're cracking me up, Benjamin. He says, um, it's not weedy, right? Right? <laughs> Healthy, native, needed, happy bees, wild, but a good thing. Pollinator ha heaven, happy dance, colorful, wild, busy for all the right reasons. Happy and sharing with nature. Good for little creatures. Refreshing. Well, biodiversity and food for birds and bugs. So cool. The answer to climate crisis. Diversity with native plants. Well adapted to a local environment. Lush. No mowing, happy, diverse. Weeds and wildflowers. Unkempt but real, fruitful. <laughs> Bold statement to the neighbors. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for your your reflections. I, I greatly appreciate that. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Ooh, I'm going to put this last one in here. Sound. You'd actually hear buzzing and chirping. I really... Um, that's something that I am really excited to have with me this spring. Um, okay, I appreciate you con contributing to um, that little reflective prompt. I really appreciate it. I'm going to go move forward uh, so we can meet our presenter. Our presenter today is Benjamin Vogt. He's with, uh, uh, he's a design and author over at Monarch gardens llc <clears throat> um he is the owner of the di 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 excuse me he's the owner of the design firm monarch gardens and is the author of two books uh, a new garden ethic and prairie up his work has appeared in better homes and gardens dwell fine gardening hard horticulture midwest living the new york times and the Wall Street Journal. Um, he has a website and a Facebook page, and I will send all of that information along in the post presentation email. So, um, are you ready? Are you ready for us, Ben? I'm ready for you. Are you ready for me? Are we ready, you guys? <laughs> Thank you all for joining me today. I'm giving you what is normally a 90 minute presentation in 30 minutes. So we're crossing our fingers here today on if that will actually happen. Uh, do you guys know why the cookie went to the hospital? Because it was feeling crummy. That's not why you're here. You're not here for puns. You're here to talk about unlawning suburbia and all that good. Oops, wrong picture. My wife is always playing with my presentations. I'm sorry. Uh, here we go. This is headquarters. We were just looking at a picture of headquarters. Uh, somebody in the chat mentioned uh, some compromises need to be made, and I did make a compromise on this site. I left the hell strip in intact, and there's a six foot wide lawn path up the middle, and I kept the plants short, and I didn't use any aggressive species, but we're going to talk about all those strategies that you can use when you are unlawning, unlawning uh, your suburban, urban, rural front yards, backyards, whatever. So uh, this is what we're up against. All the green on this map is a uh, habitat that um, is uh, is lawn. So if you put all these green blobs together, uh, it constitutes a, a square footage, square acreage, acreage equal to the si uh, size of Georgia. Um, all that lawn, all that, all those green specks, uh, requiring 20 trillion gallons of fresh water to be used to irrigate those lawns every year, compared to the 30 trillion gallons we use actually use for food crops, which is stuff we eat. I have not seen any of my neighbors eating their lawns, so I'm not sure why we live in these lawn-dominated uh, areas and locations where we don't actually do anything with them. And so, you know, so many folks they just use their lawn to walk on it when they're mowing, and that's pretty much it. 
Uh, 30, I'm gonna, this is one of the uh, uh, <laughs> unhappy quotes. Uh, our, our slides for you today. Of 30 commonly used lawn pesticides, 19 linked to cancer, 13 to birth defects, 21 to reproductive disorders, 15 to brain damage. Of those, 17 are detected in groundwater, 11 are toxic to bees, 16 are toxic to birds. Idling a leaf blower, just idling, not even using it. Idling a leaf blower for 10 minutes produces as much toxic exhaust as driving a large pickup truck like a Ford F-150 for 235 miles. I don't know where you all live, but uh, you just saw where I live, and it is a cavalcade of, of um, toxin spewing machines from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. for five or six months out of the year, um, which is why I'm going to go uh, live in the country uh, with somebody who's wearing a blue shirt. Okay. <laughs> I can't, I can't take it anymore. Lawn is a weed, right? It's not, it's not the native plants in there. It's not even actually the weeds that are in there. It's actually the lawn itself that is a weed. And that's the paradigm shift, I know, uh, which is why we're all here today listening to this talk. As I know, many of you also uh, realize less than 2% of the original tall grass prairie remains, making it more threatened than the Amazon and Indonesian rainforest combines. 70% of all U.S. grasslands across the lower 48 are probably uh, going to be gone by the year 2100. That's just right around the corner. Now, there are many maps showing the original extent of the Great Plains, and they're obviously, they're obviously prairie grasslands, savannas in every state in the country, but this is just looking at the Great Plains. But there are many maps. This is the map I'm going with. Um, this is the supposed uh, extent of the original Great Plains before uh, colonial uh, settlers, settlerism came in. Dark, uh, this brown is everything that's been taken away. So cornfields, soybean fields, roads, uh, lawns, all that good stuff. So that is a stark contrast. This map is already almost 20 years old. The dark green on here represents fairly intact uh, grassland, uh, Great Plains habitat. You can see the Flint Hills there in the east and, and the big old massive sand hills because you, it's really hard to grow corn on rocks or on sand, right? So, you know, looking at this compared to this, uh, where can we practice conservation? Where can we wake people to the issues of conservation, celebrating the home places, uh, places where they live uh, that they are so proud of? Native plants provide 15 to 35 times the caterpillar biomass versus exotics, which means uh, it, one of the benefits is bird food, right? Birds are, are you know, uh, nestlings uh, in the nest for two weeks or so. They are just eating a steady diet of caterpillars and spiders and moths and all that good stuff. Native plants support our 3,500 plus native bee species, and those native bee species have longer flight times than exotic uh, invasive honeybees, which, and they provide pr uh, specific pollination like buzz, which increases fruit yield quality and shelf life. So if you grow your own food, your vegetables, your fruits, you want to have a little prairie patch or a native plant patch nearby to bring in the beneficial pollinated insects, as well as predator bugs like, like wasps, which are so important to a healthy ecosystem. Native plants are adapted to our local regional climate, at least for a little while longer. Uh, their blooms are in sync with emerging insects, maybe not this year, uh, supporting specialist insects that require leaves or pollen to feed their young. This is who we're gardening for, right? It's not just for ourselves. It's for the entire community. It's for other cultures, other peoples. And here they are on the screen, those other cultures and other peoples. Now, plants are not just decked. Uh, decorations. They're not just pretty. They're not just collector items to put on a shelf like plates or something. I don't know if anybody does it anymore. Uh, plants are useful as well. Plants clean air and water and soil. They reduce stormwater runoff. They cool structures so we don't have to run our air conditioning a, a, as often. There's just so many environmental uh, benefits to plants. Views of complex nature uh, outside of classroom windows, outside of office buildings, outside of you know, our homes windows. Views of complex nature increase the mental and physical health. Uh, school kids, office workers, patients in hospitals, a lot of studies on this stuff. If you read my book and do garden, I think you're familiar with them. Well-designed, diversified landscapes actually raise home values and spur community engagement and, and uh, while reducing crime. Kids don't need lawn. Uh, when, when I let my son loose outside, man, it is straight into the prairie. It is straight to gathering sticks and we're having sword fights and we're seeing what, what butterflies are visiting. We were just naming birds at lunchtime right now that we're out there. It's a perfect day for birds to be out and about gathering things and 
getting ready to mate, right? Uh, so uh, we have very little lawn left, so he maybe doesn't have uh, any options. He has to, we have to go into the prairie. We have to go into the garden beds and explore and see all that good stuff. I live on the edge of West Lincoln where we have a lot of acreage lots. So this is just right behind me. These are three acre lots and they're almost completely uh, slathered in lawn. You can see there where the Cornhuskers lose their football games on the horizon. I'm a Gophers fan, I'm sorry. I shouldn't admit that. So we need to go from landscapes that look like this to yes, landscapes that look like this. Our state capital was originally supposed to be in Prairie. Instead, they're out there mowing it five times a day and watering it six times a day. I said, every time I drive by, they're either mowing or watering. It doesn't seem to matter what time of the week it is. Wouldn't this look lovely if it, if it was native prairie plants celebrating our state, celebrating our cultural history, all cultures, all the histories together. We have so many landscapes in urban areas that are just really totally useless because you're not going to picnic out here. You're not going to propose to your to your significant other out here. You're not going to kick a soccer ball around out here because you're going to break your ankle really fast. So why is this in lawn? The grounds crew was thrilled uh, when they heard that we were going to turn this to prairie because they're riding their, you know, they're riding lawnmowers, high center of gravity. They were always scared they were going to tip over on this 45 degree slope. So we made it useful. You know, these 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 areas and, and urban landscapes are going to be cleaning the air, reducing stormwater runoff and again, so many benefits. Right. And I think these landscapes look really beautiful in the winter as well. I know I talk to a lot of people who look at this and think, oh, it's so weedy and messy. I need to cut it down. And I guess I'm totally insane or something. But I look at this and I think, oh, my God, this is freaking gorgeous. Like I, I think this is just from an aesthetic perspective, 20 times better than anything I can get during the uh, active growing season. But I'm, I'm really strange. And these landscapes don't just have to be in sun, they can be in shade too. This is an early shade meadow. The flowers have, have long since come up in here. Right now, this is just a matrix living green mulch or ground cover of sedge. There are tons of sedge, sedge species for shady urban conditions. This is under mature oak trees. So we have these native sedges in here, four or five different species, and then a lot of shade perennials um, uh, embedded in here as well that bloom throughout the growing season. So it doesn't just have to be a, a sunny spot for these types of landscapes. This client contacted me and said, I don't want to have one square foot of lawn out front. And then I made them my second spouse because this is fantastic. Um, and the really cool thing is, and they keep reporting in, the really cool things they have is that they have not been reported to weed control. They have really positive conversations with people who walk by. It's a very active sidewalk going by their house because it leads straight to a school. Um, and, and people are constantly co co complimenting them and talking about the landscape and learning about the landscape. And this is why we need so many of those, so many more of these spaces so that people can engage with them, see them, uh, start to accept them and see them as, a, as, as normal, right? Um, there is an alternative out there. There's a healthier alternative, and this is not a dangerous alternative either. Thick layered gardens using native plant communities are always going to increase habitat as well as climate resilience, and they're going to minimize the need for weeding, mulching, watering. Now, when we're designing landscapes, trying to emulate nature, natural systems that we have in, out in the wild. We do use something called matrix style uh, design. And the matrix is basically just your ground cover layer, your living green mulch, which is, which is composed of sedges of grasses placed every 12 inches on a grid pattern. And then you come in and you mass and drift at different forbs uh, that, um, that are growing, uh, the, that are blooming throughout the growing season from April through October, right? So you can see this here, ground cover layer, that's your matrix layer, that's grasses or sedges. Then your seasonal theme layer is different flower species blooming at different times during the growing season. And your structural layer is taller herbaceous perennials, short shrubs, tall shrubs, short trees, tall trees. Um, but your most, most of your biomass is probably gonna be in that ground cover matrix layer. I mean, this is what we see out in the wild. This is what we see in a prairie or a meadow yet. So how do we emulate this and how do we bring this home? I can guarantee you if you put this landscape in a front yard, it would definitely look a little bit more weedy um, because the flower punch isn't up there. People respond to flowers in very positive ways. So if I was going to create this landscape in a front yard uh, conversion, we would definitely have more flowers, bigger masses and drifts, you know, so a little bit more of an aesthetic punch um, as far as blooms go. This is a Budula gracilis hellstrip uh, in Oklahoma City I saw a couple years ago. <laughs> Budula gracilis is awesome. I love to use it as a, as, a, as a matrix plant as my main ground cover. 
Um, so this is all established and this is beautiful, but the ecosystem services are minimal because the diversity is minimal. Even if we just put a few forbs in here, like Symphial trichome oblongifolium or Latris aspera, Echinacea pallida, Calarone volucrata, right? Just, just a few different things. Uh, we'd really be, be up, upping the ecosystem services and, and I think appealing to more people. So a natural landscape design, there are lots of strategies we can employ uh, uh, to help people see the space as intentional, to help them read it, to help them make sense of it. Uh, one of that is using masses and drifts. So you will have five of a kind, seven of a kind, 15 of a kind. It just really depends on how large your landscape is. Let's say you have five Echinacea pallida. That's one mass, one group. Those are planted 12 inches apart. And you just repeat that mass of five several times across the landscape. That way the eye can move across the landscape, sort of connect the dots and it's easier for them to make sense um, of the space and not see it as so wild and chaotic. Uh, something that extends from this is also considering using ju having just one or three species, four species blooming at one time. Uh, usually anything more than that really starts to overwhelm a viewer and, and, and they will see it as more weedy uh, when we start to have five or seven species blooming at one time. Now, this is garden design, right? This is different than prairie restoration or prairie conservation. So I just want to point that out for you. Traditional garden design methods can still be employed and, and are important to employ, uh, like uh, taller plants in the back of a border bed taller plants in the middle of an island bed. That way we have that sort of tiered effect and that will also help people uh, see it as an intentional space. So here's an example of a small 300 square foot uh, uh, garden bed outside of a client's home. We have the taller species, the Echinacea, the Pygnathemum and the Anemone uh, in the middle and towards the back and then the shorter species towards the front, Monarda, uh, the Asymphial trichum, Calero. Uh, there's Coreopsis in there as well. And then our matrix in there was two Boodalua's, Curtipendula and Gracilis. Here's what such a landscape would look like in the fall. This is a very busy corner lot uh, in urban Omaha, just <laughs> insanely busy. Um, but you can see there just the one cultivar in there, the purple dome, New England aster. Otherwise, we got the uh, Redbeckias in there, Eryngium, Eucafolium. You can see with the yucca type blue leaves in the bottom, uh, Liatris aspera. Um, but one thing I want to point out about this landscape is there's a relatively consistent size or average across the landscape. Most things are roughly about 18, 24 inches tall. Just a few architectural forb specimens are going to be taller in the landscape. So this also makes it a little bit more approachable. Uh, we evolved out of the savanna, out of grasslands, right? We need and want, you know, it's to, to see into the distance, to see predators uh, coming for us. So we have enough time to figure out if we want to fight or flee or climb up a tree, right? Um, so we have this genetic memory inside of us and this is how we translate it into wilder landscape design uh, where folks are used to having lawn. Now there are several ways to prep the site. Uh, this is always a controversial slide. Uh, because I am not an advocate uh, advocate of sheet mulching, solarizing, or even using a sod cutter, but actually just using one application of glyphosate to, to kill the lawn. So it depends on how large your landscape is, what your physical, physical ability is, what your ideology is. There's no, there's no necessarily one right or wrong way. Uh, so do what you see is best and works best for your landscape and your site conditions. Goodbye, lawn. You know, climate change, climate disruption, it's going to, I was talking to a weed inspector a couple of years ago. They say, we know lawns are not sustainable. We know we cannot have them 10, 20 years into the future. We just are not going to have enough potable water to, to keep them looking green. So something's going to have to be different. So it's going to come in our lifetimes. It's going to change. In the meantime, I'm actively trying to do my part. Uh, I'm so thankful for all the wonderful clients who, who come to me and are, and are willing to take what sometimes is a, a, a big risk. Although of the hundred landscapes I've put in, we've only ever had two issues with neighbors or weed control. And one of them was pretty quickly resolved. So now in our designs and our projects, we are using plugs, which are younger, smaller plants, a lot easier to put into the ground. Uh, also a lot more affordable, especially if you have a larger space, you know, one gallon pots, 20 bucks, 15, 20 bucks, maybe more. Uh, a tray of 32 plugs is going to be 110, 120, 130, something like that. Same thing for 50. So here's that size comparison for you. 
I can't believe I used to use gallon pans a long time ago. Oof, so hard to dig in the clay soil. So matrix dye design, we're going it, we're going back to it because now you've seen plugs. Now you have an introduction about how we're designing these spaces. This is matrix design. This is the this is the living green mulch. This is the main ground cover. Let's just say it's Budalua gracilis everywhere. I can't see my next slide. I think it's Budalua gracilis, 12 inches apart on a grid pattern. Okay, there you go. There's your there's your there's your mulch. You never have to use wood mulch again. You're going to let the plants do it. And then we come in and mass and drift different species. Uh, into here and we're going to have continual or mostly continual bloom succession across the landscape because this is a smaller bed we can't pack in as much as we might want to so but we're still going to have really good color in here really good support for adult pollinators and such these landscapes are not sucky su uh, su sucky they're not sexy when we install them okay this is <laughs> watering plants are in the ground takes two or three years sometimes for them to to really get kicking firing on all cylinders mixing drill is my preferred tool because it has more more torque and less rpm um, than other drills household drills not going to work uh, in a clay soil uh, environment if you have loam or lust or something like that you'll probably be fine with that but mixing drill is what we use with a 36 inch tall bit with a three inch diameter now since this is being recorded i can just let you guys go back and look at my plant list this is just a very general vague plant list from which i work from and add diversity to depending on the site um, so sun on the left shade on the right so Watch the video and pause it when you watch the video. I know some of you are asking, okay, come on, you've only had two issues out of 100 with your client landscapes, yes. Um, but still, you know, it's a very Gestapo-esque system, right? It's neighbors reporting you to weed control authorities. It's not the weed control authorities driving around in a car because they don't have the employees or the gas money to do that. So um, it's, it's very nefarious how this works. But if you have this kind of landscape in your front yard, you're more likely to get reported to weed control. These are, these are much taller species, four, six, eight feet tall. Now, this is a rain garden, okay? This is filtering pollutants off of a, a nearby business's parking lot. It's perfect where it is, okay? But if you got a one, you know, one quarter acre, 8,000 square foot urban suburban lot, putting these tall plants out here and, and, and this sort of arrangement is not going to fly. Here's Pacara aurea and a shade border. Uh, it's a very it, it's a very gregarious species. It, it's its behavior is to spread. It wants to spread and put out seed and, and and put out rhizomes and all that good stuff. So it's the wrong plant in the wrong spot, and it's just taking over. So this looks weedy to me. This is definitely weedy. We have a monarch enthusiast here. Fantastic, great support monarch larva, wonderful. Uh, but using Asclepias syriaca in these really tiny beds on this really tiny lot right next to that thin sidewalk where the milkweed is gonna flop and bonk into people, you're asking for trouble. Let's use Asclepias tuberosa instead and also get in more diversity, right? More forb species, get in some grasses. Grasses are so important for weed control and site stabilization and uh, cover for birds and cover for butterflies and spiders and all that good stuff. Same thing here, evening primrose in a hell strip. Imagine you're the passenger in a car that's just parked and you're trying to get out and you're assaulted by evening primrose. This is not going to work. And yet these landscapes are accepted and considered the ideal, right? This is a professionally designed landscape. I'm sure it gets mulch applications every year to suppress weeds as well as pre-emergent uh, to make sure that nothing else can ever fill in and grow and create a more sustainable landscape. So when you're planning or researching your garden, uh, select plants based in large part on their behavior. Um, do they like, do they put out a lot of seed? Uh, do they spread a lot by roots? Is that going to work in your landscape? Uh, bigger landscapes, it's easier to, to have that happen than smaller landscapes. Uh, and that's the sociability ranking I use. You will not find sociability rankings in any book or website that I am aware of. It's basically just something you have to collate through research, reading all books and websites and just figuring out, okay, it sounds like this plant's gonna be pretty well behaved or okay, this plant's probably something I shouldn't have on my small suburban lot. So that one's off the list. So yeah, sometimes in our excitement and activism, we forget that urban wildscapes are for people too. And how we come together in these landscapes to share ideas and experiences with nature colors, how we grow and work together. Uh, 
you know, whenever you're talking with neighbors who are interested or maybe they're not interested <laughs> or, or, you know, city weed inspector comes over um, because you invited them because you got one of those really mean orange signs staked into your lawn, you know, know the binomial nomenclature, know the scientific names, because that shows you, shows people that you know what you're talking about. You're an expert. You know, these plants, these are not just weeds that popped up because you stopped mowing your lawn in May, which you should never do by the way. Uh, so, you know, you, you know what you're doing. Okay. That's, that's just what you want to convey when you're talking with people. Here is a highly designed landscape by Adam Woodruff. You can see uh, we have the massing and drifting. We have a matrix grass layer that is still establishing. Uh, height is relatively uniform at roughly 18 inches or so across the landscape. So this is highly designed. So you can go this way. Um, and there's also not a plethora of flowers in here. It's not totally chaotic. It's sort of, it's sort of subtle. On the flip side, Adam moved and <laughs> did a different kind of landscape. Again, still shorter plants, 18 inches, 24 inches tall, but a lot more texture, a lot more color, a lot more diversity. Granted, this is in a backyard landscape, so but you can go this way too. Um, there's la less massing and drifting. There's more just sort of throwing things around and, and, and seeing what happens. You can go uber simple. This is a design by Fido Studio in, in Pennsylvania. Um, they basically just have one or two Forbes species blooming at one time throughout the growing season. And right now it's Monarda bradburiana, Bradbury's Monarda, uh, and, and large masses and drifts, letting it colonize among the other plants. Kelly in Des Moines, his front yard, um, maybe in between everything we've seen in the last couple of slides. I'm just throwing as many different examples at you to see if any of these uh, jive with you and can, it can inspire you to go that direction. Here's a client, client space here in Lincoln. Our front yard at headquarters here in Lincoln uh, before the flowers really get going. Uh, there are some plants in here, like the Baptisia australis minor, Cipheal trichum oblongifolium, that have nice, short, rounded shapes that could be used in a more formal style aesthetic, more formal style garden. So they don't have, that doesn't always have to be plants that are all, you know, bedhead, right? And using cues to care is important. This is, this is our all of branch moment in creating these landscapes and, and these disturbances. So again, at headquarters, we have a nice six foot wide, very wide pathway going up the middle, welcoming people in the land and landscapes saying, there's access here. You're welcome to come in and come up here and explore further if you want to. It's not intimidating, right? Client space for preparing. Uh, grass has been killed except for areas where the pathways are gonna be. And then they put in a sitting area in the middle. Another client put, put in some stone. Cues to care are objects, um, design strategies, materials to help people see purpose and access, to see human purpose and access to the landscape and to break up the you know, cacophony of plants, the wildness, right? Arbors do that, uh, water fountains do that. If you want a really, really formal, formal garden, you can have some non-native boxwood uh, parterres and put in some wilder flower plantings inside of them. don't need much lawn. Uh, here backyard in our backyard meadow, which is just 2,500 square feet, we've got lawn for access as well as a fire break there uh, that, that, that works uh, along with this uh, gravel sitting area. Uh, pieces of art you get on Etsy and you put a solar light into uh, also can be a cue to care. Informational signs are really important, especially if they have less wording. I've been told that signs really reduce the instances uh, when, when more natural landscapes are reported to weed control authorities. I think I've got like four minutes, right, Jamie? Four minutes? You can nod or put your hand up. Yeah, something like that, okay. <laughs> so management, I mean, these landscapes are not maintained, right? When I think of maintenance, I think of something has to happen at the same time every year at the same hour. Management is much more responsive, seeing what the landscape is asking for and which direction it needs to be prodded into. Lawns can certainly seem easier to manage because we grew up caring for them. We know what it takes, we know what to do. The commercials on radio tell us when to fertilize. Uh, but these wilder landscapes require just paying attention more to the plants and what they want and where they're going showing us, um, again, how the landscape's gonna evolve over time. And I think I just said all that right here on this slide, but if you wanna read it, you can. I don't think a natural garden is more work than a lawn, especially after it's established, but it's just a different kind of work, a different kind 
of, of commitment and knowledge that you will grow over time. Just like uh, we learned uh, with maintaining lawns when we were growing up and our parents kicked us outside the house to go mow. Uh, most of the weed pressures we have are annuals, especially in the first year after that initial disturbance, crabgrass, foxtail, lamb's quarters, prickly lettuce. These are again, all annuals that are gonna fade away 90% in year two, 95% in year three, and really don't present an issue other than a, an aesthetic issue. So we'll deadhead or trim them back. Pretty much mowing and cutting things down after soil temperatures, not air temperatures, soil temperatures are 50 degrees for at least a week or um, lawns in your neighborhood are ready to have their first mow. That gives us the clue of when to start mowing and cutting back. If you need to, you might not need to. I just said 50 degrees there. Leave some of your perennial herbaceous perennial stems 12 inches tall for the 25% of native bees that nest in cavities. And I said it before, I'll say it again, just say no to no mow may. Just letting your lawn grow and turn into a weed forest uh, is not gonna be effective at winning people over. We do not have a native seed bank in our urban and suburban landscapes. We do have a, 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 an exotic weed seed bank. Uh, and then once you mow that in June, you're gonna stress the lawn out more holes and gaps are gonna open up so that more weed seeds can come in. So it's better just to plan ahead and create a garden and do things intentionally. So some parting shots at the front yard at headquarters, summer, again, my favorite season. And I, I now command you to <laughs> make fall and autumn your favorite season as well. I love the browns and the prairie grasses and, and even, even the colors that we see on the leaves of herbaceous perennials. Colors are not just in woody plants like trees and shrubs. We have so much foliage color in the fall in perennials and grasses. And there's winter with a nice freezing fog. So go out there guys and help that neighborhood grow, okay? We have a lot of work to do. Um, somebody's going to invariably ask if any of my neighbors or the neighbors of any of my clients have decided to uh, change out their lawns. And no, and that's okay. This is going to be a really slow process as any, any kind of change like this takes or any social justice movement, which I think this is. But remember, I'm here with you. You're here with one another. We all stand in solidarity together. And if you'd like to pick up my books, I got signed copies on my website. And if you want to get into more of the nitty gritty of all the stuff, I offer pocket guides and online classes at the website. And there's a discount code. Thank you so much today for joining me. I appreciate it. And hopefully I didn't go too fast. Wow, that was so great. Thank you so much. It was um, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> Yes, I'm, I'm, uh, there was a lot of, there was a, some language in there that I had never heard before, uh, drifting and what, 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 what pairs with drifting? Well, drifting and massing. So massing, I, think it, yeah. I think of a species that drifts really well, maybe like, uh, wild columbine or, or, um, nodding onion things you can do like 15 or even 30 and just do a weaving river through the landscape. That's a drift and, you know, and mass is a mass, right? Five, okay. seven together. Okay. Okay. A group, you could say group. No, I liked the mass is better. Drifting and mass. That was great. Um, you mentioned some of the landscapes take up to three years. What are you doing in the meantime? Uh, letting the plants grow. <laughs> and, and hopefully having the plants fill in. Um, I, I have started I have started doing a thin mulch layer, about one inch, uh, when we're using plugged landscapes, not seeding. Obviously, you can't seed in the mulch, but with plugged landscapes, we're doing one inch of wood mulch. And I want it to be really thin because I, I want our plants to self-sow and fill in, give us free plants, and give us that free weed control. So basically, the first year is just all about managing annual weeds that pop up if we have them. We don't always do, and sometimes it's not a big deal, and sometimes it is. Um, I didn't mention it. I just assumed everybody knew to pop your questions in the chat. So do that. Um, what spray do you use for killing the grass to begin with? Uh, any, any brand that has glyphosate in it. <clears throat> and if you're thinking of using vinegar, you're going to have to use horticultural vinegar. That's 20% and will probably rip your skin off. So um, vinegar is actually much more toxic. Uh, it's the were... only time we ever use anything is just to kill the lawn. Go ahead. Sorry, Jamie. No, no, no. Uh, I'm glad that you said that because a lot of people, yes, I've had that experience. <laughs> <That's for sure. laughs> I discovered that on my own. Um, do you work with buffalo grass at all? Question mark. 
no, I do not. I do not. And, you know, uh, for clients who have tried to use it, uh, weeds still easily get established in there. So, I mean, the question is how much lawn do you really need to have? And so I think that's where that has to, that question has to come in when you're thinking about buffalo grass usage, because buffalo grass is not about creating a prairie garden. It's about creating a lawn. Um, what do you say to some, uh, someone that, uh, the use of glyphosate scares them? Cause I definitely had to get over that as well. Yes. It's, it's, it's one of the most controversial topics. I mean, that's why I spent three pages on it in my book, Prairie App, because I knew and, and had experience in that. Yeah. Read the directions, wear PPE, don't spray on our super windy day, spray when the temperatures are right, right time of day, all that stuff. Be careful and smart. Keep the nozzle close to the ground. You're not up here waving it around like some sprinkler your kids run through, right? So um, just be, you know, one application usually kills lawns. Most of the lawns we're doing are very pristine, very well kept, very, very few weeds, and they're dead in two weeks and, and you're done. And that, that glyphosate isn't really getting down into the soil to cause issues. I mean, it's not a cornfield or a soybean field where you're spraying it how many times a year, and then you're spraying the crop afterwards after it's been harvested to reduce mold. So it's a totally, totally different uh, playing field in my opinion. That, that was a good point. I like that last point. Um, uh, can one plant annuals while the peren perennials are starting? Absolutely. That's a great strategy. You know, uh, with landscapes that I sow from seed, we're not using any plugs. I am definitely use, uh, definitely have annuals and biennials mixed in there. So we get that first year cover and that first year color uh, and support for adult pollinators in there. So yes, you could put in some, I love to use Rebecca Herta. Um, because it'll self-sow around and after a couple of years, it'll actually disappear as long as the garden has been planted densely and, and in layers. So yeah, um, annuals, yeah. Uh, do you work in wet areas overrun with cattails? Hmm. No, that is outside my wheelhouse and I'm totally cool with that. <laughs> <laughs> that that is a, that's a situation, Rachel. <laughs> yes, that's a situation. <laughs> Um, you briefly mentioned shade plants. Can you say more about what to grow in a shady or steep area where lawn dies anyway? Yeah, oh, that's a perfect place to do this sort of thing is where you're having trouble growing lawn anyway. Just go to my website, go to the search bar on the bottom right of the page, type in shade plants. I have several, several posts on shade plants with extensive plant lists, and that will help you out for your, so you can do further research to make sure those plants are suited to your site conditions. Um, how to keep, uh, how do you keep brome and other seeds from taking over, uh, native plantings? This is coming from someone that lives out of town. So that might be, yeah. Different. Yeah. yeah. Again, out of my wheelhouse, thank God, uh, because brome is right. Oh my God. Right. You know, it's just, do you, you know, when do you till it? When do you spray it? When do you burn it to try and just try and knock it back? And, and then what, what aggressive native species do you try to put in there to see if they can hold their own? Yeah, that's a whole other ball of wax and something I definitely want to experiment with someday, but I'm sorry. So I think like the application, Patty, of, of Brom, you know, that's not, that's not the landscape design, urban landscape design. So yeah, that's, that's not, like yeah. Different, -ish, different, yeah. <laughs> different battles. <laughs> um. Uh, is there any harm in planting bulbs like daffodils and tulips in native landscape? No, there, there is absolutely no harm in doing that as far as environmental harm. If you want my opinion beyond that, I did write a recent uh, blog post on daffodils, but you might not like it. <laughs> um, once you establish size of the area and create a grid, could it work to start with small patches of plugs then add to the area in phases? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, if you're on budget, budgetary constraints or physical ability constraints, absolutely. The only, the only issue is that, you know, you'll have one area that's mature, one area that's half mature, and then one area that's totally immature, right? So you just have to be able to accept that sort of, that patchiness. Um. Can you talk more about that th the that three? I th it says tree layer, but I'm not. I'm wondering if she meant the three layers that you were you talked about at the beginning. Right there. Yeah. 
Yeah, so there are several layers in a natural landscape, right? The ground cover layer, which which for me is is most is mostly uh, warm season bunch grasses when we're dealing with sun landscape, and it's mostly sedge species when we're, sedge species when we're in a shade landscape. So those are planted every twelve inches across the space, and then we come in, we do our masses and drifts uh, of different forb species uh, with bloom succession from April through October. Um, so that so we'll have mostly the ground cover layer, the grasses and sedges, and then the second most plants will be the flowers, and then the and then the least number of plants will be taller perennials, shrubs, and trees. And um, what is that? And and this is what it looks like is if you wanted to actually do a plan. I think that would that eases a lot of people's you know need you know because we're moving out of that control aspect into I think that that uh, helps the design aspect of it. Uh, what does water watering look like for this type of garden? <laughs> oh my God, it depends guys. So many variables, especially with the freaking droughts that we're having in the last two years, it is really making me upset. Cause usually I tell clients, we only really have to water for two to four weeks. Uh, this is this is clay soil or clay loam soil, by the way. We usually just have to water for two or week, two, for two or four weeks, and then those plugs are established because plugs get going so much faster than gallon-sized plants because their roots are hitting that native site soil so much more quickly. Um, but yeah, I mean, last summer I had clients doing deep watering every three or four weeks with new installs that we did last spring, and frankly, probably people should almost be watering right now after the dry winter we had. Obviously, if you have less soils or sandy soils, you are going to have to water a lot more, especially on sand, um, especially for that first year or so. So it really depends on climate, water, site conditions, drainage conditions, slope, um, the plants that you're using. Uh, but generally, it's just a few weeks if we're clay or clay loam soil in the good old days. Mm. <laughs> um, all right. So this will be our last question. And then make sure uh, y'all stick around for... Um... The last little bit, uh, some Master Naturalist uh, updates. Um, so Corey asks, uh, top tips for someone just starting out with this type of planting. Do you want this to be a self-serving top tip or not? Because I literally have 18 online classes that are going to take you right through it. I mean, my book, Prairie App, takes you right through it. So, I mean, those, th those are my top tips. It's a whole reason I've spent years putting this material together is to help do it yourself or folks uh, go about this. So, and just, you know, I've got what, 300 to some free articles on the website as well too. Yeah. Great resources. I, I, I dip in there often. Um, okay. Uh, thanks so much, Benjamin. I really appreciate you uh, coming out, hang out with us today. Thanks guys. Uh, Prairie up and unlawn America. Thank you. Let's see if you can stop oh. sharing. That'd be great. Thank yep. you. Um, if y'all have, feel free to, uh, reach out to me on, uh, if you have further questions, I can always, uh, get them over to, to Benjamin. He also has a website and I'll send over some of uh, his uh, information as well. I'm going to share my screen so y'all can, we can get some updates happening here. Okay. Is it all pretty? Nope, you're not seeing. Let me stop sharing one more time. I know how to do this. I'm a professional. Ah, there we go. All right. So we have some upcoming events that I just want to kind of ramble through real quickly because I want to respect your time. <clears throat> Um, our, this is the March webinar, but we are currently in March. So we're talking about April, the next month. Um, our April webinar series is, uh, uh, framing nature education through photography. Uh, master naturalist Bree Nugent is, will be joining us, um, on her, uh, photography journey. Um, she's also an environmental educator at the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. So she has a very unique, uh, uh, look, uh, through the lens, through the lens. So join us. I'll send that out on the list serve. You can find it on um, information and, uh, and details on the presentation and registering at the N Nebraska Master Naturalist website. Um, in April, the next month that's coming, uh, we have our core 24 plus training. Um, if uh, you are uh, not a Master Naturalist, uh, head over to our website, www.ne.com. 
masternaturalist.org and you can find out information um, on how to become a master naturalist. We have a, a core 24 plus training that's happening at the end of April and I'll get you in there if you're interested. Um, if you are a certified master naturalist and you would like to get some continuing education hours, um, I have included Sundays. Uh, the core 24 plus part of that training is a uh, um, a, a workshop for certified master naturalist and incoming master naturalist in training to come together to get some continuing education. We'll be talking about bio blitzes, um, community science, city nature challenge, and iNaturalist. So you'll get that continuing education hours. And um, I'm hoping that you can connect with the incoming master naturalists to create community connection and all that good stuff. Um, the there's an event page on our our Facebook page where you can register for this and it's also on our website. Um, June numbers for the Nebraska Master Naturalist training are really low. Spread the word. <laughs> we, we need we need to get these numbers increased and so this is my first pitch. Um, if you know of anybody that's interested in becoming a master naturalist, this June training has many spots available. Um, feel free to head over to our website for more information. Big cool news. Uh, Joe Langaby, a master naturalist, uh, has been collecting uh, butterfly data um, for many for several years at uh, Loritzen Garden and uh, Fontenelle Forest. She has her own co data collection protocol. And she has uh, gotten contact with Cody Dreyer. He's a pollinator ecologist at Nebraska Game of Parks and community science specialist, Allie Mays. And we have worked together to take her protocol and turn it into a workshop so we can train all y'all on um, a data collection protocol um, for uh, butterflies of central Nebraska. This year is our pilot year, so we're just hitting central Nebraska butterflies. This workshop is May 4th, Saturday, May 4th from 1 to 5 in Marquette, Nebraska, which is just by Aurora at the Whitney Education Center, Prairie Plains, Prairie Plains Resource Institute, if you all are familiar. Um, this is pretty exciting. I checked registration today, and I do believe there's only 10 spots available. There's lots of interest in this. Um, it's our pilot year, so we'll have a couple more workshops next year. Um, but lots Jamie, of people are excited and happy. Yes, go ahead. I have a question, Jamie. Yes, please. Um, and I know I emailed you about this, that you have to attend the the training, but you said, so this is only going to be in central Nebraska this round? Yes. Okay. So like if I live in eastern Nebraska, that might be next year or another time that they'll. Yes, there will be. There's only like, there's very few butterflies that are separate from central. Um, so um. I think if if you wanted if you had if you were available to come to this one and you were excited about it, um, central central would, would be okay if you were in eastern Nebraska and that's where you were planning on doing your surveys. That was my other question: Is there a set place to do the survey, or like those are the kind <laughs> of questions I'm not sure about? But... Yep, it's it's public lands. Public lands, mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we'll be giving a place or. There'll be places to select from. Um, we don't have a, a, a site selection that would be on your own to go okay. to, determine your, to determine your site selection. I will be oh. sending out an email uh, to people who have registered. It is it is a commitment. It's every other every other. It's twice a month, every other two weeks um, throughout throughout the season. So it's it, it is quite. Um, quite a commitment um and i will be sending that out to uh, people who are registered so that they're aware of of what the protocol what the protocol um yeah that, is that would be that would make another difference on if yeah, I yeah, along of, with the site we would help Joe's here today you guys i didn't know joe yeah. <laughs> go ahead answer the question we would help you pick out a site to go to it's not like you just have to pick one out of the blue right uh, we're going to help if you have no idea where you want to go. We'll make suggestions. Okay. Thank you, Joe. And we want it close to where you live. We don't want you driving, say, an hour away to do this every week. You won't do it. We yeah. Want to do it where it's convenient for you. And yes. was I correct on that, Joe, about the eastern butterflies in the central that there was only like six species it of is, difference? It's not a lot of difference between the two. 
Okay. So that would, if you were from Eastern Nebraska and you wanted to come into the central butterflies, that, that would, that would be okay. Right, Joe? Right. right. Okay. Great. Thanks both of you. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe, for popping on and answering those questions a little bit better than I did. I appreciate it. No problem. Um, let's see. Our uh, annual reunion has been determined to be August 16th through the 18th at Niagara Valley Preserve. That's over by Johnstown, Nebraska. Um, the details for that will be out very soon. Uh, we have a super lovely reunion committee um, that has been helping me uh, or that we have been working together to to uh, make that all happen. And there's a lot of staff turnover happening at the preserve right now. And so um, uh, thank you for being patient while we get that date out. Also, if anybody on would like to be a part of a of a committee, training committee, fall conference committee, gala committee. I'm going to send out that request on the listserv um, very soon. So I, I really enjoy getting to meet more and more of you members. Um, and um, I can always use the help because I'm new and I don't know all the things. <laughs> um, okay. And our call to action today, um, right here at the two minute, two minute mark. Let's practice. Um, Strengthening our observation skills. Observation is the backbone of the scientific method. You know, curiosity, awe, and all those things come up when we're when we're practicing our observation skills. And it is it is a muscle to be used, right? Um, the more and more we use our observations, the more and more we see. It opens up. It opens up our world, and we start to see more. I'm sure a lot of you are already on board with this, but uh, a remind we can always do with reminders. So let's practice strengthening our observation skills. Let's find some examples of urban areas with less versus more habitat diversity, you know? Then let's tap into our senses. What are the differences in those two the, those two habitats? Let's really just take stock. You know, we know it in our in our in our mind, right? We know this as master naturalists. But let's bring it in, let's 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 tap into our senses. What sounds are different? What sights and smells? What what sights and smells are different between those two habitats? And I'm sure we know this. I'm sure we've done this before. But it's always good practice to tune in and not just always be with our logical brain. Uh, what feelings, words, and phrases come up as you're observing these two habitats? Um, I'm in the middle of an ice storm right now, so I'm just gonna wait to do that. Uh, feel free if you are in in a blizzard right now. Um, to just wait or, or, or go out. It's a, I, I all hail adventure. That could be, that could be good for us. I will be sending out these slides, um, the reflective prompt and all of this, all of, all of the, the ditty I just did. I'll be sending that out to all of you, um, in a PDF format. Um, I'll do my best to, um, over communicate all of the things that we just learned today. Uh, let me look at the chat really quick to see. And I think all hail adventure. <laughs> that was that was an accidental pun. Thank you, Shayla. <laughs> um, I really appreciate your time and your energy uh, over this lunchtime. Uh, thank you so much. Again, um, stay. Uh, we have a, our next is April in April. You can find all that information on our website. Feel free to email me if you have any questions. I work, um, I am, I usually don't email people exactly the same day, but I do try to work hard to make sure that I, you do not get lost in the shuffle. Um, I'm super grateful for all of you and um, spring is here. It's here. I hope y'all are getting out. Have a great one.